Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And today I've got some information to share with you, but predominantly this video is about me addressing a query that I have. Last summer, the 12th of July 2018 to be exact, I made my way down to the temporary site of the East End Women's Museum at the Tower Hamlets Local History Archive and Library. Links to all will be, of course, in the description box. And while I was there, I went to a poetry reading given by Chris Searle. He was reading the poetical works of Sylvia Pankhurst. And her poetry was news to me. And I think from the reading I've done, news to quite a lot of other people. So in addition to sharing some examples of this amazing poetry, this video is also questioning just why it's been left out of so much of her biography. Why have these works seemingly been deliberately excluded? Let's look at it. Sylvia Pankhurst was born in Manchester on the 5th of May 1882. She was the second child of Emmeline and Richard Pankhurst, her older sister being Christabel Pankhurst. In 1885, so when Sylvia was about two or three, the family moved to London. Sylvia was fortunate, as she grew older, to be able to follow her passion. She studied art in Manchester, Venice and London. She also formed a close relationship with the MP Keir Hardy and they remained friends until his death in 1915. In 1903, the Women's Social and Political Union, that which is the membership card that she designed, was formed by her mother Emmeline and her sister Christabel. And their work predominantly this time was focused in the north of England around Manchester. Sylvia was involved in the activities of the Women's Social and Political Union in London, however. Sylvia was arrested a number of times for her activities, she was imprisoned, she chose to undergo hunger and thirst strikes, and suffered forced feeding. Sylvia and Keir Hardy shared a strong socialist drive that, among other things, would be a driving factor in the wedge that grew between herself and her mother and elder sister. In 1913, Sylvia established the East London Federation of Suffragettes. Their red cap of liberty is used as their logo. By this point, she was publicly showing her concern with equal franchise, rather than just ensuring votes for middle-class women, which seemed to be the focus of so much of her mother and sister's attention. By 1914, the following year, the ELF was no longer part of the WSPU. And Sylvia, also in that year, established her own newspaper, called the Women's Dreadnought. Also in 1914, World War I breaks out. This created even further distance between Emmeline, Christabel and Sylvia. Emmeline and Christabel supported strongly the war effort. Sylvia, on the other hand, in addition to being a committed socialist, was also a committed pacifist and she could not get on board with her mother and sister's attempts to support the war effort. In March 1916, the ELF becomes known as the Workers' Suffrage Federation. The women's dreadnought would eventually become the workers' dreadnought as well. During the war, she becomes more and more openly revolutionary. She meets with other socialists in activities that led to the formation of the British Communist Party. In 1921, Sylvia's outspoken viewpoints cause her to fall into conflict with the British Communist Party. In that year, they evict her from their number. The following year, 1922, Sylvia publishes, through her own publishing house, the Dreadnought Publishers, a collection of poetry entitled Writ on Cold Slate. This is some 47 pages bound, and Writ on Cold Slate refers to the tools she had access to while she was spending time in prison. These are her observations, her emotional responses to her time in captivity, to her time being tried and sentenced and placed in prison. And I am confused. When you go onto her Dictionary of National Biography page, there is a litany of information about Sylvia Pankhurst, her training as an artist, her work as a journalist, her connections with Russia and the communists and the socialists, her falling outs with her mother and older sister. But this collection of poetry is studiously ignored. And I'm not sure if that's because the author of the biography doesn't know these poems exist, or if they are ignoring them on purpose. And if so, why? 
This is a stunning collection of observations. We see the world as Sylvia sees it. We may not always agree with her viewpoints, but it is beautifully written poetry about a clearly very trying time in her life. And here is where I have my plea. If you are a biographer of Sylvia Pankhurst, or you know one, perhaps you are somebody who writes critical editions about literature produced in the early 20th century. Maybe you're a historian of suffrage. If you are any of those things, or you know somebody who is, please ask them, plead with them to do something with this collection of poetry. We need a critical edition. At the very least, these poetic works need to be included in Pankhurst's biography because they are startling. And to show you just what I mean, I'm going to read a few of them to you. And I'm also going to leave a link in the description box to the facsimile of these 1922 poems, which you can see and check out for yourselves. Here are some of the poems. What she, the old soul with demented looks. What she, the old soul with wild, wispish hair and black eyes burning in a pallid face, her fingers sticking out like waxen spikes neath the long sleeves that half her hands engulf, and shoes for lack of laces, white lint ties. Though she not tamed among the ordered file, but hither, thither, runneth o'er the grass, gathers green leaves and tells a chattering tale, her garments flapping in the frisky wind, her stockings and her garters round her feet. Now stern, the officer to order calls. Pay she no heed, but eager rusheth on to pick a crust from some cell window cast, and childish, fancying pigeons to entice, chases their buoyant flight with tottering tread. The well-fed magistrate hath felt no shame to send this old demented granny here. Mary. They named thee prostitute and sent thee here. Poor, ancient Mary, wan and parchment-faced, with mumbling chin approaching to the nose, a drooping pinched o'er toothless gums indrawn. Someone who loves thee came so far today to see thee in the cage and comfort bring. And now thou art painful hobbling back to cell, bent on thy stick with wardress aid beside. Tis all too much for thy frost-bitten feet, frozen past cure those icy winter nights, when for a bed thou on doorsteps did couch. Begging's outdated, all policemen know it, soliciting's the sin the bench would scourge, so, Mary, thou art called whore to suit the fashion. The silly bait was swallowed by the beak, as thou lackst coppers, so he lacketh sense. In brooding depths of night. In brooding depths of night, when all the air is teeming close with thought, a cry arose, and we in voiceless agony did more, echoing in tears what seemed our own heart's pain. What is this cry that pierceth with affright? What grief unbearable, no rest allowing? The burdened soul that sends it wildly forth, this that hath waked the dark and banished sleep. Eight years of prison life behind her lie. A month of freedom nestles in between ten further captive years stretch out before. She that had nothing, born of the have-nots, those numerous hordes who toil no wealth to win, she, from the haves, had taken something back. For half a year, like to Persephone upon the brink, a moment pours I from the dock to gaze, before descending by those narrow steps, unto a world of shades for half a year. Amid the dusky court a mist there swims of ruddy faces blending into smiles, and one stands forth dead white with staring eyes. Exalted on the bench that harsh old man, clad in the purple of his mayoral state, mouthing impatiently with hands a twitch, the while I speak, by right of law aloud. Oft interrupting, now he breaketh forth. His parchment cheeks distort, his eyes spit hate. Libel on libel hers that hired press scribes may circulate for gulling simple folk. 
masking what lights may glimmer forth to show their present exploitation and his sins by talk of loot, loot, loot and pillage cruel. And silly ogre stories, patent lies, gainst Soviet Russia, whence I am late returned. His soul sits in a cellar hoarding gold. O'er oh, mighty realms his power extending rules, knowing no bounds in his ambitious dreams, which still to what he has add more he would. His paper tokens pass the world around, compel in Africa the Negroes' toil, make magic fingers of far Japs to ply their art, misprize for its omega cost, because on little rice they can exist. For him in India poor riots toll, their immemorial communism crushed, robbed of their produce and by famine scourge, dying like flies whilst he exports their grain. For him in Britain too, the minor delves. Weavers and spinners follow ceaseless toil, their wage by far competitors depressed, children and parents in those eastern mills, worse fed than beasts and nothing better housed. Here, in wealth citadel, old wretched dens for him each week provide most monstrous dues, a blighting charge upon their tenant hordes. For him our children stunted, infants die, poor mother drudges leave their wailing babes, herself the exploited maiden cheaply sells to snatch youth's pleasures, else debarred from her. For bear indeed the pittance he accords to such as she who are so swift replaced. Upon his call to war go millions forth, prepared to die if he will give them bread. This is the very hub and central spring of that I fight, that hoary power of wealth, he its defender, its first magistrate, I who attack it, being tried by him, to mine antagonist must plead my cause. He hath the power and he will vengeance take, that was decided ere the case was called. For me remains one duty, one resource, to cry a challenge in this mansion house, this pompous citadel of wealthy pride, and make its dock a very sounding board for the indictment of his festering sins that shall go ringing forth throughout the world, and with it carry all my wit can tell of that most glorious future long desired when communism, like the morning dawns. When, in the black and jolting van, I pass to narrow cell of dingy walls and drear, and little window high with small barred panes. When's clanging the heavy door and double locked, and brief day to an early evening fades, crouching with stiff, cold limbs on lowly bed, the bruised spirit longing to be free, and deep, Shocked senses, trembling from the stroke, riseth that white face in the darkness here. So I'd love to know what you think of these poems. Why do you think that the 1922 publication of these poems was the first and last? Why has there been no critical edition? Why is the creation of this poetry excluded seemingly from much of her biography? Do you think that that's an error? Or can you see a good reason for it that I am missing? Because its exclusion is very confusing to me and that's the reason for me making this video. So let me know in the comment section down below. Also, you can find me on social media. I'll leave the links in the description box. Follow me there and continue the conversation. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let me know by clicking the like button. Please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.